everybody. My name is Ileana Jimenez, and I teach at Elizabeth Irwin High School downtown in Manhattan. And I'm here to talk to you about how I became a feminist educator. Often, we think of feminist education, women's studies, gender studies, queer studies, and we associate that with higher education. We think about it happening only at the college level. Well, I'm here to share with you a kind of string of stories about how feminist education is actually happening today in high school. I'll start with a story. A few years ago, I went to go visit my grandmother in Puerto Rico. And she was near, she's nearing 90. And I really wanted to capture her story. Um, my father's very reticent and very shy. And he's not really much, doesn't really story tell a lot about how he grew up. And I really wanted to know more about my grandmother and how she had grown up. So I went with my tape recorder and I said, Abuela, I want you to tell me some of your stories. And she shared something that I didn't know. She said, you know what, I grew up as an orphan. And I was taken in by a local family who raised me. And that family sent her to school. And when she was in school, she was so thrilled to be there on a daily basis because she was always raising her hand. She's always yelling out answers. She was always with the right answer. The teacher, in fact, and the teachers in the room will know that sometimes didn't want to call on her because they knew she had the right answer, right? So they wanted to give the kids a break. At the end of her first grade year, she was taken out of school. And the reason why she was taken out of school was because that family that was raising her wanted her to raise their kids, essentially kind of take care of them. So she only had one year of school. And I realized something then when she told me that story. I realized that I had found my feminist DNA. That I had found, finally, the kind of the makeup that made me who I was, which was here was this young woman, or actually elderly woman, and a young woman speaking to each other across the generations. And she was telling me how school empowered her to find her voice, even if it was just for that one year. And when she was telling me that story, I could feel the energy. I could feel how much she loved school just for that one year and how it gave her a voice. And I realized, I want to do that. That's why I do that. I do that every day, not only for myself, but for young people to find who they are through storytelling, through narrative, through activism, through finding their voice in a world that often doesn't want to hear them. So I'll go back to my high school years. I grew up at a time when Anita Hill was testifying against Clarence Thomas in a sexual harassment hearings just before Clarence Thomas was made Supreme Court Justice. I grew up at a time when Ruth Bader Ginsburg was made the second woman on the Supreme Court. Those were defining moments of my teen years. But the most defining moment, outside of historical moments, was a moment in an English class. We were reading um, James Joyce's Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. And I remember going through the chapters of this book and reading it and really connecting to his story. He, this kid was bullied, first of all. I was bullied. I was called Spick, I was called Nigger, I was called Afro, I was called all kinds of names as a kid because I was a little Puerto Rican kid growing up on Long Island in a public school. I didn't have much diversity. And I was really hurt during those years. And so when I read Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, I went, oh my God, this kid is being bullied on the playground. Finally, a story that I can connect to. And then I watched him grow up in this novel. He was that poet who would write underneath the sheets. He went to college and read all these intellectual texts and kind of wanted to be a scholar and a writer. And I thought, this is my guy. But how come I haven't found my girl? And I read that story. And at the end of the novel, I said, I haven't read the novel about the young Latina girl, that brown girl on Long Island who is this emerging queer feminist of color. Where's that story? How come my teacher hasn't brought that into the classroom? And I realized at that moment, that's what I need to do. 
I need to become that educator who brings those books into the classroom so that young people can see themselves straight back at them when they're reading, when they're writing, when they're reflecting, when they're journaling, when they're finding that voice that they so desperately need. So when I read Portrait of the Yards as a young man, I, wrote, I wound up writing this long analytical um, essay. It was an AP English class. And I went up to my teacher and I said, Mrs. Welcome, I really want to write um, a long research paper bringing together portrait with other women writers, kind of analyzing how they're different from each other. She said, fine, go. So I went to my local public, my local public library and I found a treasure trove. I found Simone de Beauvoir. I found um, Sanjo Gilbert and Susan Gubar's uh, Mad Woman in the Attic, which is this classic um, literary, feminist literary criticism. And I found just book after book after book, you know, Kate Millay's Sexual Politics, all these books. It was just like, they just kept coming and coming and coming and coming. And I was just overwhelmed. And I read Judy Chicago's autobiography about how she created the dinner party, which is in Brooklyn, actually, this beautiful feminist, classic feminist piece of art that shows the history of women, or at least a portion of the history of women sitting together. And I remember crying when I found this. It was like, I'm 17, and I'm, tears are coming down my face. And I'm thinking, why didn't I find this earlier? And maybe I had to find it at that moment in my high school career. Because that was what then led me to finding the college that I went to, which was Smith College. And I really wanted to go to a women's college because I wanted to be immersed. It was like a bath, like a spa. Like I wanted just to be immersed with other feminists, queer feminists, feminists of color, white feminists, everyone who could give me what I needed. So I went to Smith, and that also transformed my life. And it was one course that I took there that I'll never forget. It was a course on Latina and Latin American women writers. And I wound up reading people like Shadi Moraga and Gloria Anzaldúa and Ana Castillo, and writing papers about them. And it was through reading those books that I said, finally, I'm reading the books I really need, and you're giving me the language that I need to understand myself as a queer, feminist woman of color who really needed that at that time. And I also needed an epiphany, which was, what am I going to do with this? And I said, I'm going to be a teacher. I'm going to be a feminist teacher. And I'm going to bring that to the classroom. And throughout the course of my career, I've been able to bring those texts that transform my life, as well as other texts, into the classroom so that young people have a lens. And in particular, my kind of feminism, I'll tell you right now, is a social justice feminism. It's an intersectional feminism. What do I mean by intersectional feminism? I mean that it's a feminism that not only looks at gender, but it also looks at race. It also looks at class. It also looks at ethnicity. It also looks at sexuality. It also looks at politics. It looks at human rights. And it uses that intersection, right, those categories of identity, those categories of oppression, to understand the world around us. You could apply that lens to so many things, immigration, education, the environment that intersectional feminist lens, we can use that to understand a lot. So when I started teaching after, right after college, I taught in girls' schools. And I think it's appropriate that I'm standing in a girls' school. And I, I really believe in single-sex education. I went to a women's college. And throughout my seven years in girls' schools, I taught young women how to find their voices through narrative. And I challenged them to look at race and class and gender and sexuality by writing memoir. And they wrote these really powerful pieces. I'll never forget one girl who wrote a piece about being African-American and Jewish. Her mother's African-American and her um, father, her mother's African-American and her father was Jewish. And she really felt kind of torn between her two identities. In some places, she was too white. In other places, she was too African-American. And she could never find, whatever that means, she could never find that space in between where all of her was accepted. And she wrote about that. There were girls who were white 
who talked about being white, and in particular, girls who talked about having privilege and having wealth, and what did that mean to them, and how could they analyze their class. So that was really important to do in those spaces. It was hard to do in those spaces that were sometimes not always accepting of what I was trying to do. So then I left and I went to progressive education in downtown Manhattan. And I was now I was working in a co-ed school, which is where I'm working now. And my teaching had to evolve in order to essentially help and guide the students I was with now. And that included boys. So how, does that, how did my teaching have to change in order to bring boys into the conversation? How do you bring young men into being male allies, into being male feminists? And then how do I bring young women who are also alongside young, young men to understand that they also need to do this work too? So we've been able to do this together. I've brought my class here. Um, the title of the course is Fierce and Fabulous, Feminist Women Writers, Artists, and Activists. And we've been able to do a number of things. We've created a feminist class blog. It's called F to the Third Power. We've created um, an activist project where we, we support GEMS, which stands for Girls Educational and Mentoring Services, where we help them to stop domestic sex trafficking here in New York City. We've had a student who has testified before the New York City Council on street harassment. This is an English class, by the way. We read and we write, but we also act. And not all of my students are going to become activists, but I want them to become actors. So I'm going to ask them now to come up and share their stories of how they have found their feminist voice. They each have something very different to say, whether they were shaped by their own family, or shaped by the media, or shaped by politics, or shaped by, or shaped by something that happened to them personally by walking down the street. So they'll show those stories with you now. Taylor? Um, well, hi. OK. I'm Taylor, and I came into my feminist voice because growing up in, five, in a span of five years, I was told about how my aunt would daily be abused mentally, physically, emotionally by her husband. And this was because she was quiet. She never voiced her opinions. She basically did what society built her up to be, someone who was very submissive. Now she is no longer like that. She is outspoken, she's independent, and she has her own views, and she's not afraid to voice them. But she only came to be this way because she was abused, and I feel it shouldn't have to get to that point for women to be thinking, oh, I'm independent, I can have my own opinion. And I feel that we can just tell women, you know, you can be an independent person, you can be yourselves, you don't need to listen to what other people say to you. And the way we do this is simply by just encouraging women to be themselves and tell people, you know, hey, maybe, you know, we can do this. And maybe women will understand that they don't have to be weak and defenseless. They can be strong and be their own person. Hi, uh, my name is Ian, and uh, growing up with a predominantly a single mother, I was exposed to a lot of the hardships that women face uh, every day, not only in the workplace, but really anywhere. And um, I'm here to say that men need to take a bigger uh, role in helping women fight the like the uh, things like sexism and misogyny. What, it's, it's not a one-way street, and women just, poss just cannot possibly do this alone. And uh, men need to take the responsibility to stand up and say that <clears throat> um, men uh, can really help change, change things. Um, <laughs> hi, um, I'm Olivia, uh, and living in New York City all my life has forced me to face some of the worst cases of dehumanization, um, specifically in the sexualization of women in the media and street harassment. For instance, when uh, I would open a magazine or turn on the television, I would notice how gussied up and overly sexualized the women looked, 
Or when I would walk to school, I would see men calling out to women in a sexual manner, and there would always be something telling me that this is not right. And since starting my feminism class, I have confirmed my beliefs that, one, though, yes, those things are not right, and two, I don't have to be a bystander. Um, and I should not have to walk down the street and have a man incessantly harassing me and making me feel very uncomfortable, or I should not look at an image of an iconic woman in our media and who has been named the sexiest woman alive and feel bad that I don't look like her. And I come here today to tell you that you do not have to stand by and watch the dehumanization of women in our culture because it is hazardous to the growing minds of young children because they are so susceptible to depression and eating disorders and it's humiliating for women on the street. And you can do your part by like, whether you're blogging on the internet or telling a family member of your cause. And as long as you're getting your voice heard, you are making a difference. Hi, I'm Claire Hart. And I've been reading literature written by men my entire life. And it wasn't until I read Virginia Woolf that I realized a woman had the capability to write on the same literary level. <laughs> And reading her, I mean, she's a genius. She can run literary circles around the men of her time. And I thought that I, because I was a woman, didn't have the same capability to write like that. And in reading her, I realized that maybe someday, with a lot, a lot of work and a lot of trouble, I could be able to write the same way as her. Hello, my name is Steven. And as we know already, every day when we turn on our televisions, we see horrible things going on around the world and even in our own country. For example, women are denied an abortion even though it's really no one else's business but the woman herself and her husband to make that decision. Or the fact that two people that love each other can't you know, marry each other because a group of people decided that it's not natural, it's not okay for it to happen. And the media, you know, every day is like shooting messages at us like back and forth, you know, through advertisement, pictures, magazines, all these like different mediums telling us that we need to feel a certain way about our body and that we need to compare ourselves to other people and to other like celebrities, for example. And we need to compare ourselves to the fake images of these women who are obviously photoshopped in all of these magazines and advertisements. And I feel I want to change that and make um, our definition of beauty more inclusive of everyone's like height, hair color, skin tone, and just like so many different things. And one of the ways that you can do that is just breaking free from that and just turning off the television and realizing that you are beautiful and that you know your body is unique to your to yourself. Um, hi, my name's Grace. Um, so growing up as a young girl in New York City, uh, I felt like the media sexualization of girls really did affect me as a young girl, but also did the um, street harassment that I faced every single day from a very young age. So taking the feminism class at my high school, um, Emily May, who's head of the Hollaback organization, came to talk to our class about um, her activism against sexual harassment, and she invited me to talk at the New York City Council hearing against street harassment. Um, there I was, I was able to share my... Um, very traumatic and scary experiences with um, street harassment and through this experience I was able to understand that my story is one that can be shared and that it can make a change and that like, through sharing my story I can help people understand how important it is to stop sexual harassment of girls. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. If you think feminism is dead, just look at these six right up here. They're making a change today, tomorrow, and in the future. Thank you.